Uh, good morning, and uh, thank you for uh, uh, being here today. We know it's a very busy week, and uh, there are lots of events, so we're delighted that you chose this one. But we are not surprised that you chose it, because uh, we're having uh, uh, Minister Gordon, uh, who does not need any introduction. You have his bio uh, uh, as a handout, though, um, and he's Minister of Finance for the second time for uh, South Africa. Um, and um, uh, thank you very much, uh, Minister Gordon. Uh, we know it's a busy week, and we really appreciate that uh, you're taking the time to come here. Um, so I will uh, start uh, with a few uh, Q&A uh, with the minister and then just open it to the floor. And hopefully we can uh, finish on time at 9 o'clock uh, so to leave the minister some time to go to his next meeting. Um, so, uh, Mr. Minister, um, if you look at the news these days... I um, can't avoid it if I can. <laughs> <laughs> so, if you look at the IMF revisions um, of growth forecast for Africa, which just got out for, uh, in the World Economic Outlook, um, you know, uh, of course, uh, uh, growth forecast for the whole sub-Saharan African region have been revised downward. But... Uh, for South Africa in particular, um, growth is expected to be half to 0.6%. Uh, I know in the budget we had this figure of 0.9%. And um, the IMF uh, is uh, 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 mentioning a couple of uh, um, factors uh, to uh, explain uh, its revision of growth forecast. Of course, external factors uh, like low export prices, uh, but also um, policy uncertainty and tighter monetary and fiscal policy. At the same time, if you look at the news like we do, uh, you see that um, the RAND has reached a four-month uh, um, uh, high and, quote, as confidence returns in the news. And, and also South Africa just raised um, in the international debt market a $1.25 uh, million billion dollar uh, bond for 19 years at a, at a spread of 335 basis points, so which is about a little bit less than 5% compared to the Ghanas, in, uh, which are around 10% or more. So how should we uh, uh, read those two uh, types of uh, signals that we're getting? On the one hand, uh, the growth uh, forecast is being uh, revised downward. On the other hand, we, we're seeing that there is some positive sentiment coming back. Well, good morning to all of you, and also uh, on behalf of my South African colleagues, thank you for being here uh, at 8 o'clock in the morning. Um, uh, I see some bleary eyes uh, still as well. I, I suppose we, we need to start by saying that South Africa is very different from most, if not all, the African countries, and indeed uh, many developing countries as well. Uh, since the democratic government came into office in 1994, we've had, uh, on the one hand, a repair of our national balance sheet, which ensured that debt came under control, deficits were managed properly, and by the late 1990s, uh, we were on a very secure uh, fiscal footing for, for a start, uh, together with uh, the independence uh, that the Reserve Bank or Central Bank enjoyed in terms of our new constitution, which was adopted in 1996. Uh, since then, and up to 2008, uh, as I said yesterday to another audience, so some of you might have been there, uh, we've actually, as I say to South Africans, never broken a, a fiscal promise. In other words, if we said that we would meet a particular deficit target unless something extraordinary happens, we would meet that deficit target, uh, which is what we've been doing since 2009 and, and 2010. Uh, our disruption uh, post-2008 comes from, as I pointed out yesterday, uh, from your shores, uh, because we were going at 4% growth. Uh, our debt-to-GDP ratio was well below 25%. Uh, we had a fiscal surplus in the 08, 09 years in South Africa, all of which post-2009 uh, and the Great Recession coming to our shores was utilized uh, to ensure we borrow more, we do not impact negatively on the social spending in South Africa, uh, which by and large we've been able to sustain up to now. And uh, whilst we've cut 
expenditure in, in many different forms. We have not resorted to what the Europeans would call austerity. Nobody's pensions have been cut. Social assistance has not been cut. Major social programs, education, health, housing, etc., have not suffered negatively at all. Uh, in the most recent budget, we've had to uh, take a bit of money and, and push it back in expenditure terms into outer years, uh, but that does not negatively impact upon our, our delivery uh, by any means. But what is unique about our country amongst emerging markets is that post the Great Recession, although there was a slight peak in growth in 2010, uh, we haven't recovered, uh, as many others did. But many others who did recover today find themselves in negative territory as well. Brazil is an excellent example uh, of a country that's grappling with the same issues as well. So as, as we said today, we recognize that whilst we are managing the macroeconomic side, both fiscal and monetary, fairly adequately, the big issue confronting South Africa is growth, uh, and in particular, inclusive growth. If you want to talk about social cohesion or economic inclusion or exclusion, uh, South Africa is a classic example given the kind of history that we've had uh, of marginalization of the majority of South Africans. And whilst we've made tremendous progress in the last 20 years, that marginalization is still uh, one that is deeply felt. Secondly, we have, let's call it uh, first level uh, structural problems and deeper structural problems. So the first level problems is uh, how do we get better electricity uh, supply, which we will in the next five years. Secondly, uh, how do we man manage our labor relations environment and reconstruct it in a way in which we have more harmonious relationships uh, less lengthy strikes uh, w within our own country, uh, which begin to negatively impact on growth. And then we come to the more uh, structural, uh, deep structural uh, reforms that we need to undertake related to our past. So we still have a very oligopolistic economy. Uh, there's huge concentration in many important sectors of the economy in the hands of very few, few companies. So the IMF and OECD will regularly say, we need to reform our product market or deconcentrate our product market. Uh, very nice euphemisms. Uh, but in essence, what they're saying is get more small businesses and medium-sized businesses to start competing with big businesses and get some space for themselves. So in, in some, the growth challenge is, is one uh, that in some ways the IMF figures begin to reflect. Uh, our response to that is to uh, certainly in recent months, build confidence amongst the private sector, which has capital that we don't have at this point in time, uh, in the quantities that are actually required. Secondly, uh, encourage them to become partners with us in ensuring to the best of our ability uh, that we don't uh, get downgraded to junk status in the coming weeks. Uh, thirdly, uh, to look at co-investment projects between the private sector uh, and government, whether it is in respect of renewable energy, uh, IPPs in relation to coal and gas, co-generation of energy uh, by mining firms, for example, through small plants being created, uh, or in infrastructure and other ventures which will give us greater competitiveness. We're also exploring new areas uh, of the economy, uh, one utilizing the weak exchange rate, so there's been a significant rise in tourists coming to South Africa. We have some application forms in, in the front here, <laughs> if, you, if you want to join the queue. Um, and uh, the second area, for example, is what we call the oceans economy, where both uh, servicing of uh, ships, uh, repairs to ships on the one hand, but exploring the long shoreline that we have has become quite a priority project within uh, our government as well. And, and the raising of the bond and, and uh, the optimism, if one can call it that, that has been shown by bond investors, in a sense reflects some of these dynamics that are at play uh, within the country. And there can't be any doubt in the minds of either ratings agencies or those that we owe somewhere between 1.7 and 2 trillion uh, rands to, that we have both the willingness uh, and the ability to pay when that is necessary. And that's been our record. Uh, over, over, over the years. So for many industrial sectors, we still remain 
uh, a very attractive uh, destination for FDI. What we require is FDI on a, on a much larger scale and investment by South African companies uh, on, on a larger scale. So scale is the issue, not the trend that, that we're actually seeing. And uh, we need to resolve uh, some of these constraints that I've outlined in a, in a more assertive and, and urgent way. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, um, I would like to come back um, to this issue of um, social cohesion that you mentioned. But before that, please allow me to go a little bit um, into the details of the budget, uh, which we read with uh, great attention. So we feel that the budget uh, sets a middle course uh, when it comes to fiscal consolidation. Um, which uh, leaves uh, structural measures as a very important policy tool. Um, so, uh, but there are some questions about the implementation and the pace of implementation of those structural measures. So it would be uh, uh, great if you could elaborate on, um, you know, the plan uh, regarding state-owned companies uh, and their reform, uh, and also um, the structural uh, reforms regarding infrastructure and especially about the pace. So at, at one hand, we need growth. The course is set. Uh, structural reforms uh, are an uh, important lever, but will they deliver in time for the country to grow faster? Well, one, one, there's no guarantees, uh, as you know, in, in this regard. No are there textbook uh, chapters that you could open and say, if you do one, two, three, mm. you will get that outcome. But in, in both those uh, respects, we, we have, uh, firstly, a realization, uh, take the state-owned companies, mm -hmm. that their current forms of governance, management skills, and financial capability and stability is not as a collective way, way it actually should be. Some are do very well, mm -hmm. some not so well. Uh, so over the last six to eight weeks, we've had a process uh, championed by our deputy president. In fact, I met him. Uh, on, on Tuesday before leaving for Washington, and a group of ministers whose task it is in the next few weeks uh, is to propose a different way in which, as a state and as a shareholder, we manage state-owned companies. Selection of boards of directors, the way in which uh, management is chosen to ensure that they have the right kind of skills, uh, a review of the financial stability and capabilities of each of these institutions. And, and where necessary, certainly amongst the smaller state-owned companies or enterprises to either merge them or close them down over a period of time where there's duplication. Uh, one example that we've announced that the work will now begin on uh, is South African Express, which is a small company that belongs to the same stable as South African Airways, broadly speaking, and South African Airways itself in making it a single company and rationalizing uh, the capabilities that they have, so we pull both, both of them hopefully uh, are, are out of trouble. Mm -hmm. On uh, infrastructure, we've been doing very well uh, over the last uh, five or six years, spending approximately 900 billion rands over three year periods uh, over the past, and some 850 billion rands in the coming three year period. And the coming three year period is quite different in composition of spend compared to the past. In the past, uh, a large percentage of the spend was concentrated in Eskom and Transnet. Transnet is the logistics company, Eskom the energy company. In the coming three years, you have a much more diverse portfolio of spending, water and sanitation, uh, housing, uh, roads, uh, including then energy and, and logistics as, as well. What we are certainly exploring at this stage uh, is, as you pointed out, a more accelerated way uh, of uh, implementing these projects, but ensuring at the same time that the pro proper project cycles are actually gone through so that we don't take unnecessary uh, risks in this regard. And uh, we'll be looking at new ways of financing uh, some of these projects, and in particular, looking at possibilities for co-investment co by the private sector uh, in, in some of them. Okay. Great. Thank you very much. Now, in addition to uh, fiscal consolidation and structural reforms, it seems that, um, at least in the budget speech, there is a third policy tool that is, that is um, suggested. Um, and I read, uh, you mentioned the need to act together to address declining confidence and the retreat of capital and so on. And you mentioned these partnerships among role players. What do you really mean? Well, as I indicated, that, you know, 
we, we still have uh, uh, quite intense political debates about the role of different uh, role players. So if uh, we're talking about the business sector, there will be a section of our uh, political family and, and outside that will say, yes, the business sector is a friend, let's get involved. Others will say, no, we don't trust these guys, let's not get, uh, get them involved. Similarly, business and labor will have particular views of each other. And the call that we've been making and intensifying is that what we need to achieve as a country can't be done by any one role player on their own. Mm -hmm. Secondly, that we do require to create uh, some kind of platform for a so social compact or a social contract that at least can take us through the next three to five years uh, and beyond, ideally, as, as well. And, and thirdly, that we need to intensify our efforts uh, to build uh, an element of operational cooperation and minimal trust amongst these role players um, and so that we can move and not be paralyzed as we uh, have appeared to be. And there's very intense efforts uh, in each of these regards, both in respect of uh, the business sector. Uh, for example, the president and deputy president met a group of 120 business leaders mm -hmm. just before the State of the Nation address on the 9th of February and a further meeting will take place sometime early in May. Uh, I think this Friday there's a meeting between uh, the senior leaders in our government and the labor constituency as well. And at the same time, business and labor have been talking as well. And they're getting fairly close to uh, resolving uh, issues such as balloting before a strike actually takes place, uh, narrowing the gap between them on what should be uh, and how should the minimum wage operate within the South African context? How do we reduce the number of days that are lost through strikes mm -hmm. uh, as, as well? So I'm optimistic that we're moving in the, in the right direction and that we could deliver some results. Okay. Thank you. And now moving to so, uh, social cohesion. Um, um, given the unemployment rate and uh, the inequality in the country, um, um, uh, um, there's this need to create jobs, um, remove regulatory constraints in some sectors. So the budget mentioned um, uh, less energy intensive, but also more labor intensive um, uh, uh, jobs such as tourism, the ocean economy, which you referred to agriculture and agro-processing. But again, uh, could you tell us more about the implementation of those, those policies? What do you have in mind? Politi politicians must only talk about what they want to achieve, <laughs> not, they not what they're going to do. <laughs> now, Im impl implementation is usually uh, a major challenge uh, for both businesses and governments in many respects. And uh, in, in each of those areas, uh, that's the challenge that we both are trying to overcome and intend to overcome. We, we've adopted a methodology that has its origins in uh, Malaysia, uh, the quick, fast, something, something. But we've given it our own South African name called Operation Pakisa, which means that you get all of the stakeholders in, in one room, so to speak, over a six-week period, and have a very directed set of conversations about how a particular objective is to be achieved or a problem is to be solved. Now that is what has happened in relation to mm -hmm. the ocean's economy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, a, a, an intellectual foundation has been created, if you like, mm -hmm. uh, in a city called Port Elizabeth or Nelson Mandela Bay Municipality, mm -hmm. where we have a municipality, a big partner university, and that university is now beginning to become a center of excellence in relation to uh, the ocean's economy. And uh, I think there's a bit, lot more confidence that we're using this kind of approach where there's very clear role definition of each of the players, mm -hmm. we will get the implementation processes uh, moving faster. On the infrastructure side, some things work well and others don't. Uh, and that clearly is an area that we need to do more work on. Thank you. So my last question will be on urbanization. It's going to be the last because you're going to fall asleep. <laughs> and uh, that urbanization is something that we feel here at Brookings is very important for the continent. So some of our colleagues from the metro, uh, we have a metro department, um, uh, made a trip to the Gauteng City region and came back very excited. Um, and, uh, but when we look at other countries, uh, uh, in the region, we find it very difficult um, to emulate a little bit the uh, example of this Gauteng city region. 
And we're looking for leadership on urbanization, basically. <laughs> so can you tell us a little bit more about the experience, for example, how your ministry deals with uh, this Gauteng city region? Uh, in some other countries, they have very difficult relationship between the central government and municipalities and so on. So that would be something we appreciate. Well, uh, urbanization is a phenomenon that none of us can uh, either deny or stop. And in, in the South African context, I think by 2020, some 60% or more of our population is going to be urbanized in, in one form or another. Secondly, uh, it's the metro, uh, metropolitan municipalities, but other major cities as well, that act as magnets uh, for opportunity both for South Africans and for people from within the region as well. So South Africa is a host to uh, many million people millions of people from uh, neighboring countries who both contribute to our economy uh, but become part of the uh, dependence on the social wage uh, in, in, in the South African context as, as, as well. Um, the Gauteng city region, Gauteng is a province, I'm not sure, how many of you have heard of Gauteng in the room? Okay, so let me explain. So Gauteng is one of nine provinces in South Africa. But it produces, what, 60% of South Africa's GDP. So that's where Johannesburg is, where Pretoria is, where the air, uh, major international airport is. And uh, that's, it, it's the uh, financial center of Africa in, in many ways at this point in time, uh, and perhaps for a long period of time as, as well. And uh, it, it, it has three uh, metropolitan municipalities, one near the airport called Ekuruleni, uh, one where the executive seat of government is, Pretoria, and the other is Johannesburg, which is well known to all of you probably. And the idea there is that these three uh, metro municipalities, if you put them together, cover 90% of the geographic area of the province of Gauteng. And for planning purposes, uh, for example, you can't have three metro municipalities planning, for example, housing development, or even spatial uh, planning within that region, and the province doing its own planning as well. So the city region is, is a, a, an important project to understand all of these entities and create a, a basis for collective planning, collective action, and collective envisioning of the kind of future that, that could, uh, uh, the, the, the sort of region could actually move into. At some stage, we might talk and there is, uh, let's call it speculation, but nothing in real terms at the moment, where the three metro municipalities could disappear and Gauteng could be the equivalent of one of your big regions in, in the U.S. or other parts of the world as well. Managing urbanization uh, is, is a difficult one, given the kind of, uh, again, spatial legacy that we come with uh, from our past. So uh, South Africa still has the majority of its black population living approximately where they lived 30 years ago. Nothing major has changed. Some of you uh, have been involved in housing projects and so on, which are intended to uh, better inter spatially integrate our cities and create more economic uh, possibilities, better transport systems. But transport remains a big weakness, uh, public transport in particular, in compensating for the special, spatial disparities that we have uh, in, in our country as well. Uh, the National Treasury is involved in providing support together with the World Bank to these metropolitan uh, municipalities to see how we could assist them with better planning uh, in, in some of these regards and developing the skills that the metropolitan municipalities will require to manage uh, the urbanization process as, as we go forward. We also have a separate ministry, which is where I was before I return to this job, which is also responsible for municipalities and the other uh, processes that that department also uh, gets engaged with, with the metropolitan municipalities. I think a, a big uh, topic globally and, and uh, in South Africa uh, now is the role of cities in economic development. Uh, the Doing Business Report focused on eight of these metro municipalities by the World Bank which was published late last year, is a very useful uh, platform for us to start engaging uh, the governance structures in metro municipalities uh, about what they do well and what they don't do well and what they need to do better. 
if they have to provide the right kind of uh, support for economic development and investment mm -hmm. uh, in their cities as well. And again, the city region project and the province of Gauteng is doing some excellent work in that regard to create uh, fora where uh, these uh, governmental agents constantly interact with uh, businesses, understand what their needs are, and find the ways of actually responding uh, to those needs in both a proactive way, but also through greater responsiveness uh, as, as well. So in, in, in sum, uh, remember our, our uh, structures of government are sometimes less than 20 years old. Uh, and whilst the metro municipality boundaries are approximately uh, around for 10, 15 years, many of the other municipalities are going through boundary changes each time we have elections because we want to reduce the number of municipalities uh, that, that we have in South Africa. We also have a, a group of municipalities in peri-urban, uh, peri-rural and rural areas that don't quite have the fiscal capacity that mm -hmm. the more developed municipalities have and in the coming years, we need to develop alternate ways of, of supporting them uh, also. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Okay, now is the time that we've all been waiting for. Um, there's coffee in the back, too, for those who, are, who have been bored by what I've been talking about. But <laughs> I'm going to open the floor to Q&A. Um, uh, or comments. Uh, comments, too. Uh, please keep your comments um, uh, brief and identify yourself. And we have about 20 minutes for that. And uh, yeah, so I think there's uh, one, one hand there uh, and one hand here. Thank you. And uh, yes, good morning. My name is David Marsh from OMFIF, that's a think tank in London. I'd like to ask a question, if I may, on the external front regarding monetary reserves. Uh, two things. We've had this BRICS bank set up with great fanfare about a year ago with this famous contingency reserve agreement. Could you tell us under what circumstances that could be used? Because quite a number of the countries in that group, not so much you, but some of the previous uh, high flyers like Brazil are in a bit of trouble on the external front. Could we foresee that being used? And then you've had a bit of a flip from the gold price increase and your monetary reserves are actually not looking too bad compared with, say, Nigeria. Could you tell us a bit about uh, what that means for South Africa as an economy, the fact that the gold price has gone up now after those years in the doldrums? Okay. And we'll take a second question there. Hi. Um, good morning. I'm Ahmed Fateha from Bloomberg News. Um, sorry, I can't stand up. Um, so uh, a, local, uh, a local magazine uh, uh, cited... Um, S&P saying that downgrade is a real possibility. Um, so how do you see that risk? And what would be the consequence if that happens, if, if, um, if South Africa is indeed downgraded by S&P? Thanks. And we can take a third one yes. from this side this time. We'll come back to this side, but I just need some balance. Hi, <clears throat> I'm Ken Opala, an assistant professor at Georgetown. Uh, I have a question on political risk, uh, sort of similar to the uh, uh, debt situation. Uh, so uh, given the murmurings that we've been hearing about a potential downgrade, uh, what, uh, what, do you, what do you expect to happen on the political front? Uh, do you see the political situation at the national level in South Africa stabilizing, or, or should we uh, expect uh, more turbulence on that front? Uh, especially in anticipation of the uh, municipal elections uh, uh, that are coming up. Can be okay. Can take two more. Okay, we'll take two more. So I have the gentleman there with the raising his hand. Thank you. I Barry really Wood. need this side of the, the the floor to be a little bit more dynamic. Hello, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Barry Wood, uh, Money Web. Uh, I'd like to ask you, Minister, in terms of, first of all, congratulations on the rebound in the RAND and uh, rebuilding confidence. How much further do yeah, you have? a lot of influence. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How much further do you have to go uh, in your talks this week? Uh, I know you'd like to avoid the downgrade, but uh, would you say you're halfway there of rebuilding confidence in South Africa, or is it a harder task than that? Okay, I really need one question from this side. Okay, the back there. Thank you. I'd like to hear some good news. 
So if you could um, talk about maybe some celebratory activities or maybe there's a great sporting event that's coming up, uh, something that uh, you could promote that uh, would provoke, provoke an interest in visiting South Africa that would be like the ultimate sales pitch. You need to come and see this right now. Okay, I think we have the Minister of Finance, so am I right? <laughs> but, uh, right. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> well, the good news is that we have a new rugby coach. <laughs> uh, so hopefully we do better at rugby, but we do reasonably well there. The second is last week, there were the, or this week, there's the swimming championships in Durban. That's the city I come from. Uh, to see who would qualify for the Olympics, and that's uh, many of the leading swimmers were there and qualified. Uh, thirdly, well, even with the rand at about 14.50, uh, coming to South Africa to spend your dollars is still a worthwhile proposition. Uh, so join the other 16% increase in tourists that are coming to our country. And uh, uh, come and see all, all the wonders of, of South Africa, uh, which has a great deal of diversity uh, in what you can enjoy from mountains to, to the seaside. And ultimately, South Africans are uh, hopeful, uh, optimistic, and resilient. That we, we know, we've been through lots of difficulties in the past. If we are not hopeful and optimistic on the one hand, and resilient uh, on the other, we wouldn't have coped with everything we had to cope with uh, under the apartheid regime. Uh, and notwithstanding what is going on, I think uh, we, we have the wherewithal in our DNA, if you like, to uh, overcome some of the difficulties that we confront now and, and go beyond. I mean, whenever you're in the middle of a storm, it looks like the worst thing possible. But storms don't last forever. And I think the, the question is, what level of resilience uh, and uh, optimis optimism can you share with your population? But importantly, uh, what kind of wisdom pervades ordinary people in the street in South Africa in order to understand uh, where we are as a country and uh, the kind of expectations people still have of a better life, which I think we can achieve uh, in due course if we solve some of our problems. Which brings me to the, the, the downgrade issue. I mean, we can't uh, tell ratings agencies uh, what to do, but we can say to them that, uh, remember, the recession had nothing to do with South Africa. And, you know, sometimes we have very short memories. It, it actually was imported, if you like, or exported to, to South Africa. Secondly, that we do have uh, a very significantly stable uh, approach to fiscal management and monetary management in, in, in South Africa. Thirdly, uh, our fault lines in terms of what our legacy has given us, some of which I described earlier on, are also well known. Uh, fourth, where are we in terms of building confidence? I'm, I'm amazed at the amount of uh, positive cooperation we're getting at, at the moment. Because South Africans, whichever, whether you're the ordinary person in the street who's going to suffer from uh, increased inflation, and uh, at the moment because of the drought, we're experiencing that uh, in potential uh, increases in food prices, or whether you are a bank that has, has to uh, worry about additional borrowing costs. As, as a result of the downgrade, all of us are united in our intent to make sure uh, that we put our best foot forward and uh, don't move in, in that particular direction. And I think we have a case. I think we have a case. And in the next couple of weeks, uh, we'll be able to demonstrate why we have a case for uh, none of the uh, ratings agencies to do uh, anything drastic which would uh, harm South Africa in, in, in the medium term. But if in their view, uh, or in the view of some of the ratings agencies, uh, a downgrade is, is necessary to junk status, I'm not sure whether all of them will move in the same direction at the same time. And uh, it means that another battle has to be fought in order to recover uh, investment grade status for South Africa, uh, if, if that actually has to happen. So uh, we will continue with our work, and we have a lot of work that we've done both within government and in the private, with the private sector and labor, which uh, we'll be able to talk about shortly and uh, indicate uh, that we're not sitting on our haunches, 
uh, and that we are actively trying to overcome uh, some of the challenges that we have uh, and that we have plans that we are intent upon implementing, not just talking about them, which is a requirement that uh, many have actually uh, put, put to us. So we, we're on our way, and you know, as South Africans, we try our best until the last moment. So we're going to give it our best shot uh, and uh, hopefully achieve uh, the kind of objective that many would like us to, to actually achieve. The consequences of a downgrade, technically speaking, are well known. You know, you, you'll get uh, some capital leaving, uh, you'll get inflation uh, increasing, uh, and that then could set into motion uh, a number of other factors as well. Whether that actually happens or not will depend on the kind of uh, uh, optimism that we can maintain both within the South African uh, body politic and more generally in society and the way we are perceived. Now remember, we're living in, in, in a world today the IMF didn't only downgrade South Africa's numbers, it downgraded virtually the whole world's numbers yeah. uh, in, in the last couple of days. And the fascinating thing in 24 hours of conversations in Washington is that nobody can quite tell us categorically what is this ailment that the global economy is suffering from. What, what, what exactly do we pinpoint as the three causes of uh, this gloominess on the one hand, the continuous downgrade of growth, growth prospects on the other hand, and the inability uh, of the institutions that exist to use some kind of diagnostic to spur the world into action as we did in 2008, 2009, when we did save the banking system of the world, particularly in, in the developed countries, uh, your, the United States one in particular, but others as well, there's still remnants of the impact on the banking system that we can feel in Europe, for example, that hasn't quite uh, been, been resolved yet. So we, we're living uh, in a global context where demand is low, productivity is low, growth is low, investment is low, uh, the experiment with negative interest rates is raising uh, more concerns and debates uh, rather than uh, the categorical answer that we thought it would actually produce. Uh, trade uh, is, is low as well. So all of these factors are moving in the wrong direction and surely they will then impact upon uh, Africa more generally and, and uh, the most developed economy uh, within the continent as well. But our approach is not to keep pointing outside our borders and say that's where the problem is. We've got our own uh, challenges and difficulties and potential and opportunities and it's important to focus on those and rally South Africans behind that uh, set of initiatives so that we could go where we, uh, wherever we can in terms of improving the situation. The New Development Bank um, is very much alive and well. I have a colleague here who can give you a blow-by-blow -blow account of, of uh, the fact that A, it is established, B, it's got its key personnel in place, C, it's actually advertised for more uh, personnel and that process will be concluded in the next few months. Uh, the first batches of capital have actually been paid in. Uh, the request for projects has gone out. Uh, the five countries have responded to the request for projects. A screening process has, has uh, been completed and decisions will be announced shortly uh, by the BRICS leaders in terms of which uh, of the projects are to be supported. So the BRICS bank is working and working faster than perhaps any other institution uh, of a similar sort uh, in our history. Um, South African reserves have been always around uh, 50 billion dollars, uh, plus minus, and depending on exchange rate and other considerations, they swing between 46 and 50 uh, in terms of the numbers uh, that we've seen. The increase in gold price uh, hopefully helps uh, the industry. The gold mining now is three or four kilometers down uh, below the surface of the earth. Uh, costs are high and uh, any increase in gold price makes marginal mines uh, more and more productive and it helps the industry to keep uh, uh, people at work over, over a period of, of, of time. So I think I've answered uh, all of those questions. Yes, well. sure. Thank you. So just before I open, uh, we're having a, 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 an event on the global economy with uh, uh, Jason Furman from the Council of Economic Advisors, uh, I think on Friday. Mm -hmm.
on Friday. So we will also continue this conversation. So if you're interested, please join us. Um, yeah, one question here. Uh, then another there. Thank you, Amadou. My name is Tom Getman, and I'm a consultant and board member in South Africa. Um, Mr. Minister, you spoke uh, quite eloquently yesterday about the land distribution issue, but could we hear a little bit more about um, the best practice process that's being sought, especially in the Eastern Cape, which has vast land areas that can be very productive? And then a question that's in a lot of people's minds here is, since you make good sense, any chance you could stand for president in the next round? <laughs> <laughs> so we have, um, I have the gentleman there, but let's go to the left here, the, the lady in the front, and then we'll come back to that gentleman there. Hi, I'm Claire McGraw. I'm a graduate student here. Um, I think <clears throat> no, no discussion about the South African economy is really complete without some attention being paid to the recent constitutional court case. Um, and I'm wondering, really, if you could speak to that. I think uh, we're all aware of the important advances that were made towards protecting democracy in the Constitution of 96, and one of those being the, the public protector. And I think the president's recent disregard for her recommendations have caused a lot of uh, concern about the future of uh, South African leadership. So perhaps you could just speak to how the outcome or the, the president's um, responding to the uh, to the result of the Concord case um, will influence the markets, if at all. Okay, the third question there on the next to the wall. <clears throat> Good morning, uh, Minister Gordon. Uh, Amadou C. David McGill of uh, Insight Consulting. Uh, Minister Gordon, when you mentioned, uh, when you were speaking of infrastructure, you mentioned that mention of looking at new ways of financing and co-investment co with the private sector. A lot of people talk about PPPs, uh, you know, not in terms of simply financial obligations, but ob allocation of risks and the government and private sector uh, being positioned to um, e exploit a particular co uh, competency. When you mentioned co-investment, is it the same as the PPC, PPP, or was there a different sort of arrangement that um, was unique that you were envisioning uh, for infrastructure financing in South Africa? We have 10 minutes left, so if... I would say these are the last questions. These are the last set of questions. Um, going, going, gone. Go. Okay. <laughs> there's, there's one there. So there's uh, one. Hi, my name's Rachel, and I work with Talent Beyond Boundaries. Um, and AdCorp did a recent study that realized that there's 800,000 unfilled skilled positions in South Africa. Um, and I imagine that stunts the economic growth, so I was wondering if there our programs or how that's being addressed. Thank you. Thank you. All right. We have, I think, five questions. On, on the land issue, uh, I grew up in the middle of a city. So all I knew was uh, tar, bricks, and mortar. So me and agriculture don't quite get along uh, too well. But if I had our director general here, he'll, he'll wax a little lyrical because it comes from the Eastern Cape. But br broadly speaking, the potential is still huge on, on the agriculture side. Um, there are, I think, very good examples of uh, established farmers assisting uh, new entrants to uh, farming and creating very viable enterprises, whether it's uh, the wine farming or grape farming in, in the Western Cape, uh, or similar, I know the sugarcane farming in KwaZulu Natal and Pumalanga uh, have fascinating experiments where uh, a leg up, so to speak, has been provided to uh, new and small farmers uh, in order that they could uh, fit into the production process, uh, fit into the supply chain, uh, get access to markets, uh, and begin to operate on a much more sophisticated basis as a, as a commercial ent enterprise. So uh, those best practices are there. Again, as I said yesterday, I might have said it earlier, the issue for us is scale. If, if you could magnify uh, some of these best practices by 10,000, uh, literally overnight, and I think we have the potential to do it, uh, it will make a huge difference to people in the kind of way in which they see life prospects and develop uh, both commercial and farming skills as well. 
And if you get the value chain right uh, and access to markets in particular, uh, it could become a very viable way of earning a living and, and bringing up uh, a family in, in our own uh, environment. Co-investment and, and PPPs, let me, let me put it differently. What we're saying is there's a whole range of possibilities for financing uh, infrastructure projects. So we have very excellent PPPs in the roads network that Sandrail has put together over the last, what, 15 years or so. And those mainly are different forms of PPPs. But PPPs take time to put together. Uh, they require skills on both ends, uh, both the, the private sector and, and the public sector in terms of ensuring, as you said, that the spread of risk is done in, in the right kind of way. And often when inexperienced people get involved, you get risk loaded onto the government side and the private sector walks uh, away with all of the benefits. But the whole idea here is to uh, leverage all of the resources that are available. So we have an organization called CESA that brings together asset managers, ins insurance companies, and the financial sector more generally. Uh, and, and they are looking at new ways of investing within uh, South African infrastructure projects uh, as well. If you have time, there's a lady sitting in front here who's got a lot of experience in uh, housing projects in South Africa. So our colleague here can decide whether you want a two-minute advert from her uh, about how well things can work mm. uh, in, in this kind of way. But that, those are real-life examples of, of what we are actually uh, talking about. Uh, skills and uh, unfilled jobs, there is a mismatch. Uh, there's no doubt in, in the South African context uh, that, that we are looking at. W what we are doing through the higher education uh, department at the moment is increasing and, and strengthening existing skills development and vocational training institutions. They exist, but their quality needs to be improved, and their output needs to be improved as well, the quality of people emerging. Mm -hmm. The link between... Uh, those processes and the private sector, which some countries do very well, uh, broke down somewhere along the line in the last 10, 15 years, and we need to now rebuild and are in the process of rebuilding so that we get artisans uh, and, and uh, young people who have opportunities to actually train uh, while, while they uh, are being educated. The third is we need to educate our young people a little better that not everybody is either going to get a university degree or needs a university degree. And Northern Europe in many ways provides uh, excellent examples, as do some parts of the United States as well. I was in an event last night where we were talking about this. So that's the one set of problems. The second is information asymmetry. The information is sitting in urban areas, and those living in peri-urban or quasi-rural areas just don't have access. The third is transport costs. So a young person might have some idea of where to go, but the ability to pay 50 rands or 100 rands to get to that place and uh, explore the possibilities becomes extremely difficult uh, from what we've learned. But all of, all of those areas are, are being attended to uh, by colleagues in, in government. On, on the Constitutional Court case, uh, what the Constitutional Court did... Uh, some days ago, is to bring life to our constitution. So Mr. Mashlangu here, who is uh, uh, the ambassador of South Africa to the United States, and, and myself played a small part, if he doesn't mind me saying so, uh, in the constitutional development process in the early 90s. And uh, establishing a constitutional state, the institution of the constitutional court, and having the constitution as the supreme law in South Africa uh, were very important developmental steps in creating the foundations for, for a democracy. And the court has certainly come to the party and clarified exactly what can the public protector do, what, uh, how, how much of weight uh, is attached to uh, these remedial actions of the pro uh, public protector. And if you disagree with some element of uh, their judgment, uh, what are the processes to be followed, i.e. go to court and, and uh, ask the court to give you clarity. The second element in respect of the specifics is the National Treasury has been asked to establish what amount of uh, money is to be paid, and I think the words are uh, a reasonable amount 
based on the reasonable cost. Uh, the word reasonable is put in because costs were escalated for each of those items that were actually produced. So there's another way, a process by which the state will recover those additional costs and hold those people accountable. Our job in the next five weeks is to go back to court with um, experts doing some work in this area and put an amount on the table that has uh, been agreed uh, that will be paid. In terms of influencing the markets, well, we've always said we have a solid democracy. And uh, the markets in some ways have observed that, although there's a multiplicity of factors that might have influenced uh, the kind of direction that the markets have taken. But I think, importantly, the Constitutional Court uh, and us as a country have uh, reaffirmed our faith in our Constitution. And constitutions are just, at one level, pieces of paper, us people of the United States. Uh, it's, it's these sorts of events that give it life, give it meaning, educate people about what its significance is, and educate people about what uh, the Constitution means for them at a day-to-day at -day level. And so over the next 10, 15, 20 years, we will consolidate, as, as people in other parts of the world do, a keener knowledge amongst the South African public as to what, the, what, what does this Constitution mean and how do they ensure that it benefits uh, everybody in our country. So finally, thank you very much for having me and my colleagues. Yeah. And we're finishing exactly on time. So <laughs> right. I have 8.59 actually, but thank you very much. Uh, I hope you have uh, uh, enjoyed uh, this discussion as much as we have and that we can all take better informed decisions based on uh, what we've learned today and what we can continue to learn um, uh, through the forthcoming weeks. Thank you again.